the approach that we're going to take is to look to take some uh, case studies of looking at different areas, at different kind of areas in life where science is communicated. And um, here you can see that um, lots of different contexts. I mean, maybe when you think about science being communicated, you, you would naturally think about science in newspapers and online on websites and in, in magazines. But also science is communicated in a lot of other different contexts as well. So for example, in courtrooms, uh, science is communicated with forensic evidence in particular, uh, where members of a jury are presented with it, uh, scientific information, scientific data, and they have to use that to, to make decisions uh, in, in that context. But also in business, in the, business, in the world of business, I mean, obviously there are uh, certain areas of business that are directly related to science, such as biotechnology, but there are other areas, other fields of business too. And, and so how science is communicated in that context would obviously be very different to, to in a kind of a courtroom setting. But there are other places. So, um, you know, science can be communicated through art. And that's going to be something that we're going to, we're going to look at later on and, and in kind of art installations and pieces of artwork. But also, also in kind of healthcare settings and in, in places where people are receiving treatment or you know, preventative treatment or, or whatever. All of these different places have different considerations um, owing to the different values and expectations that the people you might meet in those different settings uh, might encounter. So the first thing I wanted to tell you about um, is and, and look at specifically is the communication of science within the realm of health. And, and obviously um, at the moment, the, the sort of the big issue that, that um, we're all faced with is the, is the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, um, so what I wanted to start by telling you about is some research that we did within um, uh, an international research project that I mentioned last week as well, actually, called Rethink. So this involved my university, UE Bristol, but it also involved other universities, other research centres across Europe, including in, in the Netherlands uh, and Germany and, uh, and, and Poland and Portugal. And, and one of the things that we looked at were how people how people's perceptions of coronavirus and understanding of coronavirus was shaped. So what did they read? What did they listen to? Who did they speak with? And, and how did they make decisions that related to coronavirus in, in different ways? Um, so for example, you know, in the UK, certainly in, in, in Europe, wearing a mask when you're in a public place isn't something that before the pandemic was something that was widely done, whereas I know in Asia that that was something that was done quite a lot beforehand. But th this has been an area of, of quite a lot of change in behaviour. So certainly in the UK and in the rest of Europe, increasingly these days, people are wearing masks. But all of this has been based on scientific research on evidence on on the effectiveness of of uh, masks present preventing transmission of the coronavirus vaccine and now we're in a position where there are vaccines available for the vaccine and so there are questions about the, the proportion of people that will will uh, have the vaccine how many of them will have it so obviously it's really important that a high proportion of them take it and whether or not they choose to take the vaccine is dependent on you know their perceived perceptions about the benefits of the of the vaccine how effective it will be in preventing them from falling ill but also the risks you know the side effects that they feel they may get so again this is all science this is all kind of research that um explores and and tries to sort of understand the effectiveness of the vaccine and the risks uh, and, and how that's communicated is really important. So we need to understand more about um, how people understand um, issues such as coronavirus. 
So in doing our research on Rethink uh, about this, uh, we used a, a, a kind of a theoretical framework. So in a lot of social science research, um, we use different theories as, as kind of lenses through which to see um, what, how people understand certain topics. And we used sense-making theory. So sense-making, as it says here, sense-making is defined as a dynamic process of building or revising an explanation in order to figure something out, to ascertain the mechanism underlying a phenomenon in order to resolve a gap or inconsistency in one's understanding. So if you think about how the coronavirus pandemic has progressed and, and um, how things have evolved uh, over the course of the pandemic, um, there will probably be moments where you've done your own sense making, where you've you've um, had your own questions and concerns and perhaps worries and doubts. Um, maybe it's been about how quickly a vaccine would be developed. Maybe it would be about um, whether restrictions on our on our movement and our activities and our socialising are, are, are going to be. Uh, will work and whether they're justified or something else entirely. We all through this pandemic have been understand doing our own sense making uh, of what's been going on. So we wanted to find out more about how people do this. So um, we did lots of interviews with people across Europe and on this map it, it shows all of the places across Europe, all of the um, uh, the countries where where we did this, so we did this, we did lots of interviews in the UK, but we also did them in Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands, Poland, and Italy, and and so on, just to try and understand these sorts of sense making practices. So this is the theory. This is sense making theory, and uh, if any of you have done any research in social science, you'll be familiar with theories and how they help you kind of do your research. But the theory of um, sense making to a large degree was developed by someone called Brenda Durbin in the US. And, and what it says is that basically when we're presented with a new piece of information, perhaps it could be new lockdown restrictions or uh, new information about the vaccine, we face a gap in our understanding. So that's the person on, on the far left in this, in this cartoon. They've got questions, uncertainties, and things that they don't feel that they understand fully. Um, so how people address that is to bridge that gap in some way. And what sense-making theory tells us is that um, they may, people may use information. So they may search online or they may watch the news um, to try and find out a little bit more information, but also they'll, they'll use their own thinking and emotions and beliefs to help inform that thought process of how they kind of bridge that gap and form a new understanding. So whether it is about, you know, whether new lockdown restrictions are justified or whether um, the vaccine will be effective or, or so on, people think things through. They talk to other people as well. And in the end, they reach what, sense-making theory describes as an outcome, some kind of sort of, in a way, a resolution. So you may search for information online and, and read about the, the vaccine. And at the end of that, you may decide that, OK, yes, I am going to take the vaccine. I think it looks like it's going to be effective. Or you may think, OK, well, yes, the lockdown restrictions do seem to be justified. There seems to be some evidence behind them or whatever. But anyway, in some instances, the outcome isn't necessarily to change what you do in some way. It may be to continue doing something or to adhere to certain restrictions or rules or regulations or not. Um, but you reach an outcome inevitably, and that's a very individual process by which people do that. So what we did, I, I mentioned before that we, we did lots of interviews with people across Europe. But if you ask anybody about, well, how have you kind of made sense of coronavirus? 
it's a really abstract question and I think most people would really struggle to, to, to describe you know what they've read when they read it um, who they spoke with and listened to and the sorts of thoughts that they had really difficult to think of it in that big picture way so what we did in the end was was use what we call the micro moment methodology so a micro moment is a moment in time that is particularly important to somebody about a particular topic that relates to science so in this instance a micro moment for somebody might have been the announcement of new restrictions on lockdown restrictions or it might have been the announcement of new guidance about social distancing about how far apart people should be uh, or it might have been um, you know the announcement of the first vaccine becoming available and pe people thinking oh will i actually take this vaccine if, it, if, if it's offered to me all of these are specific moments in time and and what was important is that for each individual they were able to define what their significant moments were so we didn't ask them about specific events that were relevant we asked them to describe them to us so that they could then talk about things that were really important to them specifically and individually so these are the thoughts of sorts of things that we asked them to talk about you know so what were the sorts of issues you were dealing with what you know what what were the things that you were concerned about uh, what were you worried about what were you uncertain about you know what was confusing um what was the situation itself what prompted this in the first place and then what did you do what you know what what did you look at what did you read who did you listen to even if it wasn't something that you actively did it might have just been something that you incidentally heard in a podcast or on the radio or on tv or something like that that helped you reach that outcome that bridge that gap and reach the outcome that you eventually reached so to describe these micro moments. So what we got is this kind of full picture of the sense making process of different individuals across Europe for their micro moments, for their moments in time when they were faced with a question, some uncertainty about the information that they were given. And I want to give you a few examples of, of people that we spoke to. Um, just because I think this illustrates really well that sense-making process. So just to remind you, just to sort of see where this links into the big picture, we're thinking about how people's values, expectations, beliefs influence how they make sense of science. And here we're looking at it in a particular sort of health setting. So in relation to probably the biggest health issue that we've faced in generations, really, coronavirus. And we're understanding through sense making how people's values, beliefs and expectations do influence the decisions that people take, whether they abide and, and, and go along with lockdown restrictions, whether they'll take the vaccine, all of those sorts of things. So it's really kind of honed in specific to coronavirus but hopefully will tell us a bit more about um more widely about people's uh, values beliefs and expectations in relation relation to sort of health in, in general so one of the people that we spoke to is um uh, a 70 year old man who lived who lives in the uk and is retired he no longer works he's a retired scientist actually uh and one of his hobbies was to cycle regularly and and his kind of micro moment that he described for us was when the government in the uk and this for us would have been about march um last year first announced a very strict very tight lockdown so for the first time in our lives we were being told by the government you can't go out don't go out for your own safety um only exercise for very short periods of time so for maximum an hour only 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 sort of exercise on your own uh, and so on so really tight restrictions and for this gentleman he lived in the countryside his big hobby was cycling so for him this this posed a problem uh, because he loved cycling and would spend hours each day because he's retired cycling in the countryside so his kind of gap the questions that he said 
uh, he, he faced at that moment in time uh, were, you know, what, what does the stay at home message from the government mean to me? I live in the countryside. Surely the big risk related to coronavirus is the fact that you come, you know, the danger is that you come into contact with someone who has it. But what's the danger when I live in the countryside? I'm not coming in close contact with anybody when I'm on my bike. So what's the problem? You know, I'm out in the open, open air and in the fresh air. So when we asked him to explain, well, what did he do? How did he kind of reach some kind of conclusion when he was faced with this conundrum, this question? He said, well, I, I, I gave it just a lot. I just gave it lots of thought. And, and you know, I, I, one of the big kind of uh, approaches to life, his ethos, his kind of way of living is that he says that everybody needs to be surrounded by nature for at least two hours a day. So connected with nature out in, you know, the countryside. Um, he also thought, well, you know, people are unlikely to get coronavirus by passing in the open air. And fundamentally, lockdown means social distancing and, and hygiene. So that the, the idea behind a lot in the lockdown is creating space between people so that the, the, the virus can't spread. So he, he took his own sort of nuanced, his own approach to the lockdown and he continued to cycle and, and cycle as much as he'd done before. Um, and, you know, he, one of the things that he said was, well, you just have to interpret information according to the situation that you're in uh, and the circumstances that you're presented with. You know, I live in the countryside, being in nature is important. Uh, there's very little threat in terms of coming into contact with others. So, you know, he just said the one thing that I did change was just made sure that I didn't go into any sort of crowded places when, when I was cycling. So that was one kind of moment in time. And at that point, you know, the, the, the sort of the way that he tried to interpret and understand and bridge that gap wasn't by reading lots or, or kind of you know, doing loads of research about coronavirus is about his own thoughts and about his own perceptions, his own beliefs um, of what was important in life and how that influenced what he was hearing from the government about, you know, the lockdown restrictions and what they would mean. So just to take another example, because, uh, you know, all of the people that we spoke to were, were quite different. Um, you know, they're different occupations, lived in different countries, different contexts. Uh, different pre-existing beliefs and expectations and I think this just you know I want to give you a bit of a, a bigger picture a bit of a bigger flavor as to how people uh, understand uh, sort of science information because fundamentally that's what we're thinking about so this example is of a, uh, a male participant a male interviewee who we spoke to in Serbia um, and he is an electrical engineering student who regularly exercises. So he goes to the gym, plays football, takes vitamins, re you know, really kind of health conscious. Um, so his, his sort of questions and conundrums were about, you know, wearing a mask, what would be the benefits? Is it something that would be beneficial? Uh, and, and also the rules that were coming from the Serbian government about the lockdown. You know, how, how necessary, how important were these? Would they actually be even effective? And, and when we said, well, you know, when you were faced with those situations, what did you do? What was the sort of bridging thing that you did? You know, how did you, did you do research or, or whatever? One thing that really became clear was, was his kind of pre-existing beliefs. And his, his thought that the government was really just kind of serving sort of political interests and that, and that sort of health professionals as well might be just saying things that they feel that the government would want them to say. You know, so he said, I think that the doctors change their views about COVID to, do, to avoid losing their jobs, say what's expected of them. Um, he was actively doing search. Uh, uh, searches online, research online and, and trying to get information, but obviously influenced by his perceptions about the information that the government was giving and from scientists, but also he felt that the media was really one-sided side as well and was siding with the, with the government. 
So he said, you know, this alarmism about um, COVID-19, it's just propaganda. It's there to kind of restrict what we do. Um, and, and he mentioned that in Serbia, there was an election, uh, a kind of government election that was taking place. And, and he was skeptical about the lockdown restrictions and the fact that the lockdown restrictions were lifted just before the election took place, you know, in, in seemingly trying to kind of uh, make people more happy to kind of vote for the government or, so, or whatever. Um, and, and so, you know, he really didn't trust the media either. Uh, and so wasn't sort of taking any information. He was, he was doing his own research online according to his own sort of pre-existing beliefs. So just a few kind of, that's just a snapshot of a couple of examples of people that we spoke to. And um, there's a few sort of overall points that I'd, I'd kind of make from this and, and you know, a, a few sort of uh, key lessons really from the research. And firstly, when it comes to bridge building, people use their own internal thoughts and beliefs to, to sort of bridge their gaps. So whereas we like to think, you know, we'd like to think that people were kind of reading peer reviewed journals about the effectiveness of masks and vaccines and things like that and doing their own detailed research online. Actually, to a large degree, it's people's own thoughts and beliefs that influence the decisions that people make in relation to the science that they're hearing about. Uh, and when they were, when they were uh, in terms of the external information, um, the, their pre-existing beliefs about the government and the media had a big influence on the extent to which they trusted the information from those sources. And where people were accessing external information, as in, you know, TV, radio, social media, they were often just doing it in a very passive way. Quite a lot of people said that they didn't actively go out and do their own research. It was just information that came into them naturally through the programs, that the TV news that they would normally watch and the social media that they would normally look at and things like that. And also people's personal context has a big impact. So, you know, where people live, do they live in the countryside or do they live in a city? What's their educational background? You know, because one thing that I've not mentioned is that those who've done come from a science background were more likely to say that they did actually do a bit of research, you know, looking at journal papers and things like that, perhaps unsurprisingly, really. But people's educational background had a big influence on on how they kind of bridge those gaps. But they also spoke with family members and friends um, and people that they work with. To, to try and gain an understanding where they had those uncertainties. So people's own social circles, both face-to-face -face and, and increasingly online, you know, so who people are connected with online and who people are talking with and communicating with has a massive impact on who they're hearing, those voices that they're listening to when they're faced with these situations. And the outcomes that people reach, the decisions that people ultimately took nearly always coincided with those pre-existing beliefs. So like the gentleman, the, the gentleman who is 70, who cycled, being out in the open countryside was really important to him. And then based on that, he decided he was going to carry on cycling. And we saw a lot of that. So people's pre-existing beliefs, rather than information that they were being given, had a big influence on their understanding of, of coronavirus and the science that they were being presented with. So this is all new research. This is research that's been done in the last uh, year or so. So uh, it's been published in some reports, but we're, we're kind of yet to publish it in peer reviewed journals, but we, you know, that will be done. So you're here, you're one of the first people to hear about this uh, on this course. So, some of this, I don't know, maybe you find a bit surprising or it raises questions in your own mind as you're kind of making sense of people's sense making uh, practices. Um, so I, I, I'm just inter interested to know your immediate reflections. What does this, what do you think? Is, is there anything that surprises you? 
uh, or is it does it is it as you might have expected you know from your own friends and family this is kind of what you would have expected and just are there any questions that it presents you with you know perhaps in particular in relation to how science is communicated and what we can learn from this do you think you know what questions does it raise in, in your own mind? So I'm interested to hear from you. 